Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. The handout reference during this presentation is available for download on the audio section of our website. And so we'll begin in, in prayer, praying for the repose of the soul of Claire Taplet. This is a prayer that comes to us from Syria in the second century. It is one of the oldest prayers that we have in our uh, Byzantine liturgical tradition. Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. O God of all spirits and of all flesh, who have destroyed death and overcome the devil and given life to the world, grant, O Lord, of the soul of thy handmaiden Claire, who has departed this life, that it repose in a place of light and happiness and peace, where there is no pain, nor grief, nor sighing. And since thou art a gracious God, and thou lovest mankind, forgive her every sin she has committed by thought, by word, or by deed, for there is not a man who lives and does not sin, and thou alone art without sin. Thy righteousness is everlasting, and thy word is true, and thou art the resurrection, and the life, and the repose of thy departed servant Clare, O Christ our God. And we give glory to thee with thine eternal Father, thine all-holy, good, and life-giving Spirit, both now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Thank you, Father Joseph. Last week we spoke about uh, the life and martyrdom of Saints Perpetua and Felicity, and also St. Cecilia in passing. If at the end of the evening, which probably will not happen, we can uh, consider the, the martyrdom of St. Cecilia, then we will. Did that get handed out, by the way, Melanie? Yes. It did. Okay, please don't read along uh, until we get to the point of, of reading, because I want to be able to set up the text for you. If we can't get to the martyrdom of St. Cecilia, at least you have the concluding section with you, and we'll post the rest of it on our website. Um, but I do want you to hold on to one thing about the martyrdom of Saints Perpetua and Felicity. As you know, they were martyred in the year... 203, under the reign of the Emperor Septimus Severus. Uh, and one thing is important to remember, well, many things, but one thing in particular I want you to hold on to is that during the persecution of the Emperor Severus, uh, the persecution was not something aimed at the Christians in general. It was aimed at catechumens, those preparing to be received into the church, and those teaching them. Severus realized that the tide was against him, and he was trying to stem that tide of the conversions of people to Christianity. You'll remember he was marching through the Holy Land, the area of Palestine, on his way to Egypt. He was struck that these communities of Christians had suddenly become uh, whole villages. And he said, I have to do something to stem the tide of this. We'll talk about that a little bit more, but the Christianity was considered a danger to the order of society, that order which had, had been established by the gods. And as they turned away from the gods, and more and more people turned to the true God, they looked at this conversion as a problem and as a reason for the downfall or the struggle of the society which was uh, the empire of Rome. In 211, Severus, uh, busy defending the frontiers of the empire, died away from Rome. His final words have been preserved for us. And by the way, if I tend to read my notes a little bit more than I usually do tonight, it's because there's so many facts. I want to make sure you guys get the proper information. Okay? Um, it, uh, history hands down to us his final words to his two sons as he was dying. Do not disagree between yourselves. Give money to the soldiers and despise everyone else. <laughs> Shortly then, following that statement, the emperor died. One of the brothers then turned on the other one and murdered him. 
The survivor himself was assassinated only a few years later. Rome was decaying from the inside, and with it, its stranglehold upon the Christian community. It was at this time that Tertullian penned his famous words, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. However, what Tertullian does not state for us in that quote was what kind of soil was required for that seed to grow into the tree, the great oak tree of the church. Certainly, during the time of persecution, we see conversions, especially among the soldiers and the witnesses to the persecution. Those that saw the martyrs, many accounts of them converting on the spot, being moved to faith by the faith of the martyrs. However, the real growth in the church took place following the time of persecution. The, truly, the martyrs had planted the seed But once freedom comes, there will be no stopping the growth of the tree of faith. But the freedom that we find at this time for the Christian community following the death of Severus and his sons was a freedom of disorder. As I said last time, we oftentimes see in these early years that the more disorganized and licentious the emperor is, the better it is for Christianity because he's not so concerned about the good of the empire. But the more organized the the emperor is, the worse it is for the Christians. Pagan Rome was dying, bathed in its own sins. Eusebius beautifully explains the situation. I shared this quote with you last time. Through the grace of God, the churches throughout the world enjoyed peace, and the word of salvation was leading every soul from every race of man to the devout worship of the God of the universe, so that now at Rome many who were distinguished for wealth and family and turned with all of their household and relatives unto their salvation. The emperors that succeeded Severus tried to find a middle road, the middle road of syncretism. The emperor Alexander Severus, who reigned from 222 to 235, was said to have erected a statue of Christ in his private oratory and commanded that the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, be inscribed across the archways in his palace. In a lawsuit between Christians and a guild of tavern keepers, if you will, Alexander Severus, sided with the Christians to get the land. He said, Better that the land should be devoted to the worship of God in any form than that it should be handed over for the use of drunkards. And with this tacit allowance, Christians began building churches in the public. I want you to realize the time period we're talking about here. The first half of the third century, the 210s, 220s, Constantine is a hundred years off. And the Christians began building churches. And while the church was organizing itself, Rome was sinking further and further into debauchery. One of the emperors that reigned at the time is said to have been the high priest of the sun god. He offered child sacrifice, choosing boys from all over the empire to be tortured to death. I will stop for a moment because I forgot to make an announcement at the beginning, and that is this. If they have children watching online, this talk may not be for them. If you have children here present with you, This talk may not be for them. I will leave that up to you. The martyrdom of these women is graphic. It is not something which is enjoyable for me to teach. And it's up to you as a parent whether you've prepared your children to be able to hear these things. Choosing boys from all over the empire to be tortured to death He sliced open their sides so that he and his magicians could predict the future through reading their entrails. 
obviously whatever peace the church enjoyed at the time would be short-lived. In the year 249, the emperor Decius ascended the throne. Decius is described, and think about what I said about the nature of the emperor and the freedom of the Christians. What kind of a man is required for freedom and what kind of a man is not. I will read you how historians describe the emperor Decius. He was an able soldier, strong, highly motivated, rigorous, inflexible, whose virtues ranked him with the ancients. As I have already said, the more organized the emperor, the worse life was for the Christians. But Decius faced more than a ragtag group of so-called atheists. The Christians by this time were well organized, building churches even, as I said, in public. The Germanic barbarians were invading from the north, burning villages and raping the women. A plague of measles spread through the empire. It was so bad that it's said that in the city, the great city of Alexandria in Egypt, nearly half of its population perished. With a declining birth rate, Rome was unable to sustain the population of the empire. As one author describes this scene, quote, children not destroyed in their mother's wombs were frequently abandoned in the fields to be eaten by roving packs of wild dogs, while in the cities unwanted babies were frequently thrown alive into the sewer. Dr. Carroll says that Rome was slowly rotting. And what was the cause of its destruction? Naturally, the turning away of the people from the old religion and the old gods. They had disrupted the order, so the claim was. The empire was suffering because of the conversion to Christianity. Four months into the Emperor Decius' reign, he issued his first infamous edict against the Christians. Every man, woman, and child in the Roman Empire must make public sacrifice before the idols of the pagan gods. Anyone refusing was to be killed. The first victim in Rome on January 20th in the year 250 was the humble Pope Fabian, who with others was put down. It is said that Decius was so bothered by the Pope that he said, I would rather face a rival claimant to the imperial throne than hear of the election of another bishop of Rome. A general fear spread over the church. The great St. Cyprian in Carthage went into hiding. The bishop of Smyrna of the see of the great St. Polycarp, you will remember, apostatized. Others, however, were captured. St. Peonius of Smyrna of the same city in modern-day Turkey when encouraged to deny Christ, said, quote, It is good to live, but that life for which we yearn is better. St. Cyprian describes this scene in, North, in northern Africa in Carthage. I will read you the quote. Bodies hissing on red-hot plates and blood bathing the city streets enough to subdue the very flames of hell. Cyprian continues, Limbs, beaten and torn as they were, overcame the hooks that bent and tore them. The scourge, often repeated with all its rage, could not conquer invincible faith. Although the hook, springing forth from the stiffening ribs, is put back again into the wound, and with the repeated strokes of the whip, the returning lash is drawn away with the rent portions of the flesh. Still the Christians stand unmovable, the stronger for the sufferings, revolving only this in their head, that in the brutality of the executioners, Christ himself is suffering. Tertullian, who died ten years earlier, wrote at that time some prophetic words, which I think tell us a little bit more about the scene. He challenges those that were martyr martyring the Christians. He says, what will you do with all of the thousand men and women 
folks of both sexes, of all ages and class who will offer themselves to you. How many stakes and swords will you need? You will never destroy our sect. Mark this well. When you think you are striking it down, you are in reality strengthening it. The public will become restive at the sight of so much courage. It will long to know the origin of that courage. And once a man has recognized the truth, he is ours. Amongst those arrested at the time was a little girl in Sicily, in the area of Catania, named Agatha. You've heard her name many times. Arrested under the governor Quintianus. Quintianus, having heard of Agatha's virtues and her beauty, said, that is the woman for me. What he did not know was that Agatha was a Christian and had committed herself to the life of virginity. When she heard that the governor desired her as a bride, she hid herself. And after being captured, she was brought before the governor. You have the story before you. This is the ro- longest reading we will have this evening. I'll do my best to read it. Okay. At that time in Catania, The comely and lovely maiden Agatha was a 15-year-old virgin. Both her body and soul were adorned with various virtues and good works, for she put to death all ungodliness, disdaining cardinal-mindedness. Agatha desired only to be a bride of Christ. I want Before we go on, and I meant to say this a little bit more last time, but also with this text, I want you to understand the treasure that you have in your hand because we're able to read a text which dates back especially with the life of Perpetua and Felicity. But even this text in story form, if not written down, brings us back to those earliest days, to that living memory of the church. And we're able to be transported, in a, in a sense, to be able to taste what it was like in those days as these beautiful young ladies faced death. It was not long before Quintianus, the governor of Catania, learned of the excellent fame, virtues, and good deeds of Agatha. He then meditated upon the evil reasoning of his heart, saying to himself, If in some manner I bring Agatha to do my bidding and take her to wife, I shall profit thrice. Pondering upon these boons in his heart, the profane tyrant commanded that she be made to stand before him, beholding and marveling at her beauty, As one out of his senses, he remained speechless for a long time. Afterwards, he plied her with compliments so that she might submit to his will. He promised her many honors, majesty, and rank. However, the wise and beauteous damsel in no way considered his nonsensical prattle. Indeed, she delivered to him such a knowledgeable defense so he might immediately understand from the outset her immovable heart. The holy Agatha said, My mind is founded and established in my master Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, whereas your words are as the wind and your promises and threats as flowing rivers, which strike the tower of my mind. However, in no way shall you shake it. The more you war against it, more so shall you find it firmly established in the love of my creator. After uttering this, Agatha wept and supplicated God to grant her grace so she might enter quickly the expected and hoped for martyrdom. By these words, the thrice accursed ruler became infuriated. He commanded that Agatha be brought before him. This having been done, he questioned her concerning her family and station. She answered, I am a free woman and the offspring of the most noble family of this city, as all my fellow citizens are aware. The governor said, If you are free, as you say, why do you have practices and prescriptions as though you were some slave girl? Agatha replied, This is because I am the slave of the Master Christ and none other. The governor retorted, Put away such ill-timed words. Either sacrifice to my gods, or I shall destroy you with the harshest punishments. The saint answered, I beseech my Lord that you become as your God. These words cast the tyrant into confusion, and he then ordered his servants to beat the holy maiden on the mouth, lest she further insult his God. After this took place, Agatha 
yet spoke to Quintiana, saying, I marvel at you, O governor, who thinks himself a prudent man, how you have demonstrated such folly. I, on your behalf, entreated for what was good and honorable that you should become as your God. But you did command, O ignorant one, to have me beaten. If your gods are better than you, you should have thanked me. For I desired only what was to your advantage. But if they are worse, shame on you, O blind one. Be ashamed to make obeisance to senseless deities. Giving rein to anger, the tyrant said, How do you dare, O dishonorable woman, to utter such vile and silly words? Sacrifice to my gods. This very hour I shall deliver you to diverse punishments for your correction. Agatha replied, In no way do I fear your vengeance and torments, even if you cast me to wild beasts. As soon as they hear the name of Christ, they shall become submissive and tame as lambs. If you hurl me into the flames to burn me, the heavenly angels shall enter therein and cool the intense heat and ferocity of the fire. If you beat me with rods and tear my flesh or whatever other chastisement you devise, I have the help of my master. All the elements hearken unto him. With only his word, all the sick are healed. Demons are cast out. Paralytics are invigorated. The lame walk and many other wonderful works are wrought merely with his nod and divine will. It is he who shall deliver me from all your intentions and contrivances. At this juncture, the governor commanded that she be led to prison. The following day, Quintianus couched upon his throne as a wild wolf. When Agatha was brought before him, he said, Let us not lose any time. You will immediately renounce Christ and sacrifice to the idols. And the saint answered, Know this. I shall never be so insensible as to fall down and worship your demons, even if you will inflict upon me the most fearful punishments that have ever been heard. For I shall ever confess my God in heart and mouth. Therefore torture, punish, lacerate my flesh, and give me over to various deaths so that you might know the truth. Quintianus then ordered that the holy woman be completely undressed and that her hands be tied behind her back. They were then bid to suspend her from a pillar and flog her with bullwhips. Afterwards, they were to burn her all about her head and hands and feet. The governor then directed his impious ministers to remove the holy Agatha's breasts, whereupon those savage men carved them out of her chest wall with knives the sight of which would usher in profound sorrow to any witness. The hemorrhaging was so profuse that all the ground about her was reddened with blood. These are the trials suffered by this holy saint, who then turned her face toward the governor and said to him, O profane and merciless tyrant, how is it that you are not ashamed, O senseless one, to sever those members with which you were nourished from your infancy? Nevertheless, regarding this, I am in no way concerned because I have as my master Christ who is able to heal me if it is in my interest. The governor then bid his executioners to cast the holy maiden into a dark dungeon. They were charged not to give her any nourishment other than a little bread and water, just enough so she would not die. Quintianus charged that she was to be left unattended so her wounds might fester and smell rank. As the holy Agatha laid in her gloomy cell, indifferent to her injuries, at midnight an ineffable and splendid light shone forth. St. Agatha then beheld a certain sacred and august elder who was holding in his hands a vessel containing medicinal herbs. The elder was the holy apostle Peter, who was accompanied by Agatha's guardian angel. The holy maiden at first did not recognize them. The apostle then spoke to her, saying, It is for this reason, O daughter, that I came, to heal your wounded members. Yet the holy maiden replied, Who are you that you should care for my health? Never have I received treatment for any bodily ailment. Therefore, it is unfitting that now I should practice what I have never done previously since I was close to death. Then the blessed Peter said to her, Do not be embarrassed, O daughter, to permit me to heal you, for I am a slave of the Master Christ. It is through love that I came here to do you this favor. The holy Agatha responded, I have no reason to be ashamed before any man of the world, and especially from you who are an elder. My flesh is so mutilated that I suppose it is impossible for anyone to be scandalized in me. For your free will kindness, my Lord, I thank you much, because I did not seek it. 
The maiden then fell to the ground and prayed to the Lord and said, Blessed be God the Father and my Lord Jesus Christ, who through his apostle Peter healed my breasts and the remaining wounded members of my body. The following day the saint was brought again into the palace where the governor said to her, Fall down and worship my gods, O perverse girl, or indeed you shall receive even grimmer chastisements. She remarked, O vain and frenzied man, why would I want to renounce my master who healed my wounds so that I might worship stones? The governor asked, Who is it that healed you? The saint answered, My master Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, whom I shall ever confess with my mouth and with all my heart. The governor, with relentless hostility, replied, Now I shall test if your Christ will help you. Quintianus charged his men to light a huge coal fire there in the palace. He then bid them to cast upon the burning coals pitch, tile, and iron-spiked instruments to pierce her flesh. The tyrant then ordered that Agatha be bound hand and foot with iron chains. She was then cast on the flaming coals. This fiendish punishment brought a vehement torment on the blessed Agatha who entreated the Lord for help. In the midst of the flames, she gazed with the eyes of her heart toward the eternal life. God then helped his handmaiden as he once bedewed the three children in the fiery furnace. Straight away a fearful earthquake took place as such a magnitude that all believed that their city would be submerged by the sea. The governor, fearing the wrath of the mob and the degree of the quake, commanded that Agatha be removed from the coals. It was then clearly observed that Agatha suffered no ill effects from the fire. She was then cast into prison to await further orders from Quintianus. In her cell, Agatha could be found kneeling in prayer, uttering this prayer to the Master Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, my God, who made me from nothing and caused me to be in this world, who preserved my body from corruption and unadulterated from every carnal pleasure, who empowers me to overcome the punishments of the impious tyrant, and who vouchsafed to me the strength of patience on account of thy many tender-hearted mercies, I entreat and supplicate thy goodness to receive me this day in thy glory, that I might be made worthy to behold with my spiritual eyes thy holy countenance. Praying thus, the saint straightway reposed, her soul adorned with the beauties of true virginity and luminous with the splendors of martyrdom then went into the hands of her heavenly bridegroom to rejoice with him in unspeakable delight and everlasting glory. The year was 251. When St. Agatha's fellow citizens learned of the news of her repose, all hastened weeping to the prison. With immeasurable reverence, they took up her holy virginal body. They prepared their relics for interment with myrrh and other fragrant spices. Her precious relics were then wrapped in a clean linen cloth and piously laid to rest in a purple marble tomb. As Tertullian had predicted, the persecution of worldly powers could not stand the power of God. Within a year, Decius' bloody edict, he himself was dead. In his last moments of life, in the midst of an impossible battle at the mouth of the Danube River as it floods into the Black Sea, his last words are recorded. He saw his son in battle before him, slain by the enemy javelin. Seeing his son lying dead, he said to his army, the loss of one soldier is not important for the Roman state. Let no man mourn the emperor's son. Decius himself would never leave the swamp alive. His body was lost. His successors tried their best to continue the persecution, but like those that came before him, they were assassinated. The emperor that reigned right after him reigned for only two years. While there's many things that we could say about the years following his persecution, we can say certainly that the barbarians in the north continued to break down the frontier lands of the empire Plague continued to decimate the population, and as would be expected, financial crisis ensued. And the blame was put upon the Christians. But we know that the enemy does not lie down without a fight. And certainly, pagan Rome would not come to Christ without a final battle. 
in the year 284, in the year 284, the Emperor Diocletian ascended to the throne of Rome to deal one last blow to the Christian faith. It is often called the tenth wave of the storm. As in the past, it is the same here. The more licentious and disorganized the emperor, the better it is off for the Christians. I will describe to you the Emperor Diocletian as the historians describe him. Clear-headed, reflective, efficient, methodical, with a profound loyalty to the Roman imperial tradition. After seizing power, he did what no other emperor at his time would have done. With the entire empire under his command, he gave away a portion of his power. Realizing that the empire was too large and unwieldy for one man, he divided the empire into east and west, himself taking the east. He then appointed successors to himself and his co-emperor. For the first nearly 20 years, Diocletian did not pursue the Christians. He worked to restore the empire and, to a certain extent, did succeed. Eusebius even describes the time, saying, quote, vast congregations of men who flocked to the religion of Christ and spacious churches were daily being built. But all of this would change overnight. His successor, Galarius, was an avowed hater of the Christians. And he gained Diocletian's ear. In the year 303, Diocletian published his first decree against the Christians. All churches were to be demolished. The sacred books were to be burned. Christian officials were to be deprived of civil rights, and Christians who were not officials were to be reduced throughout the empire to the status of slave. At first, Diocletian did not allow the shedding of the blood of Christians. However, two fires broke out in a short period of time in the royal palace. And who do you think was blamed? The Christians. Diocletian then published two more edicts calling for the imprisonment of the clergy and the stamping out of all signs of Christianity throughout the empire. Persecution raged and Christian blood flowed. I'll share with you a quotation from Eusebius, writing at the time. It is a graphic quotation about the persecutions that took place in Egypt, probably the worst of the Diocletian persecutions. So bad that the Coptic Christians date their years one from this time, the beginning of Christianity with a spilling of the Christian blood under the persecution of Diocletian. The outrages and sufferings which the martyrs endured surpasses all description. Their whole bodies being torn to pieces by shells instead of claws even until life was gone. And women were tied by one foot and were raised on high through the air, head downwards by certain machines, with their bodies completely naked and without even a covering. And they furnished this most shameful and cruel and inhuman sight to all of all, to all of the onlookers. And others again died on being fastened to tree trunks and stumps for having brought together the very strongest of the branches by certain machines and stretching the legs of the martyrs one by one on each of these, they released the branches to be carried back to their natural position, planning a sudden separation of the limbs of those against whom they devised this. And all these things indeed were carried out not for a few days or a short time, but for a long interval of entire years, sometimes of more than 10, sometimes more than 20 in number being destroyed, sometimes not less than 30, and then again nearly 60 martyrs at a time. And another 
at other times even 100 men in a single day, together with young children and women were slain. Among the women that were slain for Christ were the three of our last martyrs, Lucy or Lucia of Syracuse and St. Agnes and St. Anastasia of Rome, all who died in the year 304. Lucia, like Agatha and Cecilia before her, was a young girl betrothed to a pagan man. She was from a rich family and was counted by her future husband for nothing more than financial gain. Her mother suffered from a severe hemorrhage of blood. Now, we just read the story of St. Agatha. St. Lucy, with her mother, 50 years later, knowing of the martyrdom and the healing power of St. Agatha, made a pilgrimage to St. Agatha's tomb to beseech the Lord to heal her mother. And it is said that she prayed all night and all day, day after day, at the place of the tomb of St. Agatha, until she fell fast asleep. In her sleep, she received a vision of St. Agatha, who revealed to her that her mother would be healed and that she would die a martyr. She woke up from her sleep. She inquired as to the health of her mother. She was assured that her mother was indeed healed. She then took the money which her suitor so much desired and gave it all to the poor. Knowing that she was now poor, he publicly spurned her and slandered her before the prefect. The prefect then, rather than mercifully killing her, unleashed his soldiers upon her and commanded that they undo her purity by violating her virginity. The great saint, however, became unmovable. It is said that the soldiers, trying to get her to move, decided to build a fire around her. They did that, and the fire, like in the days of St. Polycarp, whom you are familiar with, went around her and did not touch her. Finally, the soldiers, at the command of the prefect, beheaded St. Lucy. Her second birth is commemorated by the church on December 13th in the year 304. St. Agnes, our second to last saint, from the Greek for the pure one, St. Agnes was from the city of Rome. She was said to be one of the most beautiful of the young girls of the city. But when she refused marriage, when it was offered, she was turned in and accused to the governor. When commanded to offer incense to the pagan gods, she raised her hand as though to offer the incense, brought her hand to her head, as was the custom of the time, and traced the cross upon it. When threatened to be turned over to prostitution, her words come down to us. Thou mayest stain thy sword with my blood, but thou shalt never be able to profane my body, which is consecrated to Christ. Moreover, I will not offer sacrifice to thy gods, because I have hope in my God, the Almighty, my sweetest Jesus Christ, who by his help will enable me to escape unscathed from thy snares. The governor then gave order to all of the young men to freely abuse her. One of the young men came forward, and as he reached to touch her body, tradition tells us he was struck down dead. His friends, fearing what they had seen, backed away. I will share with you, I don't believe you have it, the final scene. The wicked governor heard of this event and had Agnes brought before him and said, Tell me, O evil woman, how didst thou slay the youth? Agnes answered, When thou, O governor, ordered me to the brothel, I was accompanied by a splendid youth clad in white. He deadened the desire of the youths who sought to dishonor me. However, one more impertinent than the others attempted to approach me. 
and before he could utter anything shameless, he was cast down as you now see him. The governor then said, And who is this person who has helped thee? The athlete of Christ answered, The Lord my God has sent his angel who protects me from all dishonor. The governor continued, If thou wilt prove thy words true, beseech thy God and raise the dead youth. The holy Agnes then raised her hand to heaven, and by her prayer, O the wonder, she resurrected the man. Upon beholding this miracle, the impious were astonished and exclaimed, Great is the faith of the Christians, and great is this most noble woman of God. Nonetheless, some within the crowd cried aloud, Remove her from our midst, for she doth all these works by magic. At this point, the governor ordered a huge fire to be made, and Agnes cast therein. She then made the sign of the cross and entered the flames with great courage, and all the while she uttered a prayer on her lips. Her blessed soul then hastened into the heavens to join her bridegroom Christ. The relics of the victorious virgin were then taken up secretly by the Christians and interred with honor a short distance from Rome. We have one of her relics right in the back of the room. Afterwards, you can go and reverence a relic. Someone said to me last week, I said, did you kiss the relics? And they said, well, no, I looked at them. Relics are for kissing. So you can go and you can touch the relics. If you have something, an ailment, uh, a sick hand or bad eyes, place the relics to those places. They are known for their healing powers. The last saint in our list, Saint Anastasia meaning the resurrection. She was a student of blessed Chrysogonus, himself a martyr whose name is listed in the canon of the Roman Mass. We do not know much about her. What we do know I will share with you. She suffered on December 25th in the year 304. Her Mass was celebrated at dawn on December 25th in the old days the Christmas Mass was celebrated the night before, the Midnight Mass. But in the morning, the Dawn Mass was dedicated to St. Anastasia. Thus, she embodies something of all of the women saints that we have spoken of, that which is called a second birth, by which she was born through martyrdom with Christ into paradise. A few things that we know about her was that she was betrothed like the others, to a pagan man. She refused the marital bed with him and feigned illness. It is said that at night time she would leave her home and sneak out into the highways, the byways, into the streets of Rome, which in those days women did not do. She would go to the prison where those that were to be martyred were held and persecuted, and she would bathe their wounds with her tears. She would collect the relics also and intern them respectfully. When she was discovered for her sin, she was burned alive. Within a few months of the end of this horrific year of 304, Diocletian abdicated the throne. Pagan Rome was dead. And even the most vicious of the enemies of the church could see that Christ had withstood the battle and had crushed the enemy. Within a few short years, the long-awaited Edict of Toleration would be published, and two years later, the Edict of Milan, published by the first Christian emperor, St. Constantine the Great, legalized Christianity across the whole Roman Empire. We will conclude with a quotation from Eusebius, who beautifully describes this time, the end of the persecutions, and the final freedom of the Christians. It was possible to see like a light shining suddenly forth out of a dark night, churches being put together in every city, and crowded assemblies, and rites being performed at these according to custom. And every one of the unbelieving heathen was struck not a little at these things, marveling at the wonder of so great a change, and proclaiming the God of the Christians as great and alone true. 
those of our people who had faithfully and courageously endured the struggle of the persecution again took on an air of confidence before all, and such as had become diseased of faith and storm-tossed in soul, eagerly strove for their own cure, these ones that had denied Christ and now wanted to rejoin the church, beseeching and begging the strong for a right hand of safety and supplicating God to be merciful to them. Then also the noble athletes of piety, being freed of their evil plight in the mines, returned to their own homes, going through every city, exulting and beaming with joy, and filled with unspeakable happiness and confidence that one cannot describe in words. Populous throngs in the midst of thoroughfares and marketplaces went on their way praising God with songs and psalms, and you would have seen those who shortly before had been driven from their fatherlands in bonds under a very harsh punishment, resuming their fireside with happy and joyous countenance, so that even those who before were stained with our blood on seeing a marvel contrary to all expectation rejoiced with us at what happened. Thank you very much. How many of you brought your Bibles with you tonight? All right, I apologize. I committed a very grievous sin by not quoting from Scripture. So go ahead and open to the book of Revelation, chapter 7. Chapter se- book of Revelation, chapter 7, verse 9. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no man could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes. You remember that scene from uh, Perpetua and Felicity? Clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood round the throne and, the ro- and, and round the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their face before the throne and worship, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and whence have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve Him day and night within His temple. And He who sits upon the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in their midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So, question and answer. My first thing is a question for you. What are these white robes? Why the white robes? What are they? Baptismal robes. And why are they wearing baptismal robes? Because they're now rebirthed in the Christ family. Yeah, they are reborn in Christ. St. Paul says that in baptism we die with Christ. Martyrdom is a form of baptism. Okay? And we see them wa- clothed in white robes symbolizing what? Raise your hand. Purity. Symbolizing Purity, yes, but even a more ancient symbol. Maturity. Maturity, yes, fine, but even something more previous to that. I think it's a symbol of life. Symbol of life, yes. I'm trying to get at something <laughs> even more ancient. <laughs> Resurrection is what I'm thinking. The resurrection. I'm going to have to give you the answer. <laughs> the fathers of the church tell us that Adam and Eve, before the fall, were clothed. They were naked, yes but unashamed because they were clothed in the grace of God. They wore the robe of glory, the robe of the Father. The baptismal robe, yes, symbolizes all the things you speak of, but points to the reality that they have been restored like Adam and Eve before the fall. They are witnesses to the faith. They are witnesses to Jesus Christ. They are martyrs. That's the same word. We talked about that last time. 
They are martyrs for the faith, not only and not primarily because of their blood which they spilled. Who's throwing grapes in my way? (laughs) Not only because of the blood which they spilled, but more importantly, because through the spilling of that blood, they pointed to Jesus Christ. They are robed in the baptismal robe. Everyone who is robed in the baptismal robe is a martyr, a witness to Jesus Christ. Because we have died to our former life. Whether someone has murdered us, as in these women, or not, more importantly than what someone does to us, is what we do ourselves. We have died with Christ. And as St. Paul says, we will live with Him. And when we live with Him, we point to Jesus Christ. These women who lived close to 2,000 years ago, they are still alive in God and in the memory of the church. And we stand side by side with them. They are martyrs. We also, having been baptized into Christ, are martyrs, witnesses to Jesus Christ. And I don't want you to set this, well, they're here in our missile and we said, They're off in a distance. No. They're men and women just like me and you. And when the time came, they chose Jesus Christ. They're real people. And they're there as a witness for us to point us to Jesus Christ. Okay? I hope that they remain that for us. As we hear their name repeated in the canon of the Mass, that you remember what these women did. You may not remember each detail of every woman, but when you hear those words and those names being listed off, you will remember those that have gone before us and pointed the way, the road to salvation, the road of the martyr. Okay? Questions? Deacon Sabatino, why with all of the martyrdoms happening, why are these particular women included in the canon of the Mass? Okay. Uh, I have, I, I figured it would be of use. I opened the, uh, the missile here to the, to the prayer, and I'd like to read it for you, at least the first part. To us sinners also, your servants, trusting in the greatness of your mercy, deign to grant some part and fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs. And then the list goes down of the men and then the women, Felicitas, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints, into whose company we implore you to admit us, not weighing our merits, but freely granting us pardon through Christ our Lord. Permit us into their company. What is it about these women that is so special to the Eucharistic liturgy. They're, they're named in the midst of the Eucharistic liturgy. Simply what I just said. They lived a life, though murdered, though murdered, they willingly, as we read about Perpetua and Felicity, you remember the last phrase about the story of Felicity? I think it was Felicity, I believe. I don't think she would have died had she not willed it. Hmm? She took that sword and put it to her neck and said, go ahead. It was an old way of uh, the, the, the Romans killed people, right through the neck, right into the heart. Okay, and they were dead. It was a mercy blow, if you will. She put it to her neck, and she was cut off. Now, they lived a life of witness and martyrdom in the midst, now said, in the Eucharistic liturgy. What is the Eucharistic liturgy? It is simply a sacrifice of praise. We say that God has given us these things, this bread and this wine, and all of the other things, by the way, not just the bread and wine. Huh? The bread and wine are the revelation, the fullness of the revelation of what is supposed to happen in all of, our, of this created world. God has given that to us, and we now recognize His dominion and His gift, and we say, Lord, it's all Yours. And we offer it back to him. And what does he give back to us? Huh? Yeah, bread and wine now transformed by their nature 
into what they were supposed to be in the first place, namely a place where God's life is found. These women are women of the Eucharist. They are women who offer themselves in thanksgiving. They have in their life, they manifest what the bread and wine at the Eucharistic liturgy manifests. They have been transformed into Christ who from all eternity offers himself to the Father. Yes, other women could have been chosen, but I think by reading their stories, we know why these women in particular manifest for us the revelation of the Eucharist. Not because someone killed them, but because they died to themselves that they might live in Christ. They themselves have been, if you will, Eucharisted. Huh? They've been changed so that their whole life is an offering to Jesus Christ. Okay, I might say something else, but let's, let's go on to the other. Uh, during the portions that you were reading, twice you read a word that provided I heard it right, sounded like athletes, these athletes mm -hmm. of piety. Yeah. And if I did hear it right, then I wish you would tell me what, what it means in this context. Yeah, remember St. Paul says, I've run the course, right? I've fought the fight. Our life, and this is, I'm glad you asked a question because this is why we're doing these stories during Lent, and I hope they strengthen us in our journey. We have a battle ahead. Right now, a battle of Holy Lent. And for those it's not a battle, as I've said before, they're going to wake up on Easter morning and there's going to be an Easter bunny who lays eggs. Okay? <laughs> but for those who do enter into the struggle, as these women did, over the next, what do we have left, huh? A very short, 30 days. 30 days to live out our life as a symbol, as a, as a, more than a symbol, as a, as a token of our entire life. How will we spend it? How will we spend the next 30 days and how will we spend the rest of our life? They're athletes because they entered into that struggle. They fought for the Lord. They entered into his struggle. Jesus Christ, remember this, didn't come as simply an example. That's Protestantism. He came to do with our human nature what we could not otherwise do. And then he gave his life to us that we might do it too. That we might be joined to him in his struggle for truth, in his struggle for life. So that even though the day of the cross came, as for each one of us, when the day of the cross comes, he never lost sight of the goodness and gift of the Father. And he lived through his martyrdom. Jesus is, when they murdered him, he lived through that looking into the eyes of the Father and never lost his hope and trust as Adam had done in the beginning. We too then are given that gift of participation in Christ's sacrifice, a life-giving sacrifice, that through death we might enter into life to receive what God has prepared for us, struggling with Christ. Question from Fran Griffin uh, in Vienna. She's Fran Griffin. Okay, wait, I got to use this opportunity. Hold on. Oh. I got a number of pieces of hate mail over the week because I gave people a hard time from watching online. If you're a mother of 18 children <laughs> at home, God bless you, stay at home and watch online. That's why it's there. <laughs> Or if you're, the child, if you're the mother of one child, I understand how, how difficult that is. I give you guys a hard time, I know. I just want more and more people to come, that's all. So Fran, God bless you, although we would love to have you here. The cookies taste better. <laughs> so Fran was wondering, and I'm paraphrasing, I keep losing my yeah. questions. Um, any particular way we should pray to these saints? Is there per particular petitions? Yeah. What are we supposed to do? Yeah, trusting in the greatness of your mercy, deign to grant some part in the fellowship with your holy martyrs, apostles, and martyrs. Our prayer need be no more difficult or more, more complicated than that. May I become like you. May I learn to live the life of martyrdom, whether they come after me or not. That as John the Baptist did, he was a martyr, he was a witness to Christ. Far before they cut his head off, our prayer is simple. And keep our prayer simple and uncomplicated. Grant that we might have a fellowship with them. St. Agatha, grant me the strength. Huh? She's the hands and the feet of Christ. 
Grant me the strength to be like you. And when you hear these prayers read during the liturgy, don't let them pass you by. You know who they are now. They're your friends. They love you. They, he they hear us right now. They do. They hear us right now. They know that you're here. They know that you've given up tonight for them. They're on your side. You just got to ask them to help you out. That's all. Grab hold of their hand because their hand is holding on to Christ. Okay? Uh, we... Yeah, I'm sorry. I keep pointing people. I'm not supposed to do that. Yeah, okay, no, go not. ahead. You choose the people to okay, ask I, questions. I actually, of. I want to get this <laughs> um, Guys, I've been beaten actually. by the women. That is true. <laughs> it's a women's night. It's a women's <laughs> night. That's true. Go ahead, Melanie. This is the way it is in the office, by the way. <laughs> um, we actually, we also have someone watching online who's, I don't know, if studying, praying, preparing to become a consecrated virgin, a oh, virgin. Wonderful. And she pointed out that John Paul II restored that or brought that back um, yeah. and emphasized that in the church. It kind of makes me also wonder about why is the virginity and the, that physical purity so important to the point where, I don't remember which saint it was. Are you asking me a question? Yeah. Yeah. Are you, is she allowed to ask this? Or she's an employee of the Institute of Catholic Culture. <laughs> I can ask you in the car on the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why, but yeah. why is it so that she becomes immovable? And, you know, it's, yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm not going to give a complicated answer. It's just to say that, uh, that virginity, uh, celibacy, has been always upheld in the life of the church as an expression of complete gift of self to Christ. Okay. Not in, uh, as a, in seclusion or in rejection of marriage. No, 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 no. We accept and hold up all aspects of life, which are true ways of following Christ, and this is one way. So we see these women, you saw, they dedicate themselves to Christ and forget it. They're not going to move. Absolutely not. Because they have chosen Christ as their bridegroom. As, by the way, all of us do as members of the church. The church is the bride of Christ who is presented pure to him. So not only to these women, but they become then a token or a symbol of what the church is as a whole. Okay? And so virginity and celibacy in the church has always been upheld as a way in which that life of communion with Christ has been beautifully expressed. Beautifully expressed but not to the seclusion of marriage. Because marriage also manifests that relationship of Christ and his church. And so both aspects of life are upheld beautifully. Not one greater than the other, but as an example of a way of life of following him. And there are many ways. So, not a complicated answer. But yeah. Okay, and then just basically to add to that, um, like I, I mentioned pre-Vatican, when, we, when the nuns were tell, you know, telling us about these, these particular female saints, um, virginity, again, was something to be part of us, to be respected, to be either preserved for marriage, or I think more so in this day and age, these women should be upheld to everyone that's you know, reading about it or during the Mass, think about it. What, what, what a woman is, and what, what do we have that is to be offered? And it yeah. is our, either we're the bride of Christ, or we are waiting to be the bride, the one bride in marriage. And what an example they are today of self-control in a, in a society which is, I mean, we're, I, I was reading these things and preparing for the talk tonight, I thought, <laughs> how different is that from today? Um, yeah. uh, epidemic of disease, financial crisis, uh, barbarians invading on our borders. It's happening. All right. It sounds like our situation today and the licentious life that was being lived is simply a lack of self-control and a lack of respect for yourself. These women had respect for themselves and they lived a life of self-control. And not only them, but Perpetua and Felicity, remember, married. And uh, Perpetua was nursing. Felicity gave birth while she was in prison. And uh, they lived a life of self-control because they followed Jesus Christ. And that life of self-control led to the greatest joys. 
today is <laughs> seeking joys in all the nonsense of this world and ultimately there's no pleasure found. They found true pleasure. True pleasure. There's one part of the story of Perpetua that we skipped. You know, we're putting the full text online. We ellipsed it just for time. But she, she has a vision and she's in paradise and Jesus says to her, go play. And it's, this is so, such a beautiful, simple, go play as a child. Enjoy yourself. Because a, the true one who is, has self-control is able to truly enjoy life in all of its fullness. Okay. We have another page that has St. Cecilia. Yes. Not an acts of St. Cecilia. Oh, I ran out uh, of time. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm not going to... Go ahead. I, 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 w- I don't want to read it for you, but I just wanted to mention that I, I thought I heard that there was... Um, that she was like married um, or to be married and the, as the music was playing... Um, there, yeah. she couldn't she couldn't be so she was a patroness of of music you, you rem- not in here and yeah you remember true? you'll remember that she told her husband not to touch her right. on the day of their wedding right she said don't touch me if you do you'll be struck dead by my angel by the the, the one who's standing next to me and he says there's no one standing next to you <laughs> and he says you'll be struck dead don't do it he says how would I how would I know this and she says you cannot see unless you've been baptized I remember Jesus says to Nicodemus, he says, Nicodemus comes in the darkness of night, right? Not a good thing in the Gospel of John. He comes to him and says, we know who you are. And he says to Nicodemus, you cannot even see the kingdom of heaven unless you're born again of water and the Spirit. She says the same thing to her, her would-be husband. and says, you cannot see what will happen to you and to this angel unless you're baptized. And he is. He goes and he's baptized and he comes back and he sees the fiery angel. But it is said, there is a tradition, that at her wedding, that she either heard the angels singing or she herself was singing to Christ her gift of her, of her virginity in the context of, of her wedding day. So while everybody else was rejoicing in the marriage, she was in her heart singing, and so she becomes the patron of music. It's found in it's different accounts, later accounts, a more explicit uh, detail of that point. These stories, as you can imagine, the memory of the faithful who love these women are meditating upon these, upon these mysteries, upon these lives of these women, and, and saying, what would it have been like for her to be there on her wedding day and know that she would not consummate her marriage with this man? And so the unbelievers will say, ah, and great fantasies rise up over the years about what happened, and we can't trust any of these stories. Well, no. Actually, it's the memory of the church, the body of Christ, which is able to perceive the truth of any given situation within its own life, right? And so, what was her, what would she have been doing? What would she have been doing? She would have been praying, right? She would have been singing the the, the glories of God, wouldn't she have been? Seems to me that she would have been, right? So she becomes the patron of music. It's beautiful. But those that don't believe and have no faith throw her story out and say, that's ridiculous, it's nonsense. Uh, St. Cecilia's tomb has been opened twice in history. And both times, I believe, if my memory serves me correct, 8th or 9th century first time and the second time was in the year 1599. Both times, there were multiple people present. All of them, all of them, wrote down the fact of what they saw, that she was clothed in a white and golden garment as the story of her martyrdom details, that she is laying there and her body is incorrupt, that there are hack marks to her neck, three of them, as the story tells us. All of the details as the story comes down to us are accurate, and yet modern historians reject it. Well, you can choose who you're going to believe those who have seen for themselves, is that her body is completely incorrupt. And it's there in Rome. You can go to her church. It was her home that she donated before her martyrdom. And a church has been built there. And one of the great artists of the 16th century was present when her tomb was opened and saw her body lying there 
and went and carved her body, and that's the one, that's the statue you see laying there under her, under the altar. I remember it very well because I was in Rome, and I was in that church, and I suddenly became violently ill. I had made it to her tomb, and I couldn't get up to the altar to reverence her body, and I was sitting there, and I said, I got to go to the hospital, and I ended up having surgery in Rome. So... I'm here today. Thank God St. Cecilia prayed for me. So, <laughs> anyways, okay, maybe one or two other th- comments. It's, it's 9 o'clock, so we should probably be closing up pretty soon, but is there any other comments or thoughts? Eusebius, you mentioned several times. Uh, uh, does Dr. Carroll, uh, is, is he one of the primary? Tell us a little bit about Eusebius. Please. Yeah, Eusebius was, a, uh, was an early church historian who was alive at the time of the Diocletian persecution and wrote a lot about what was going on. And he also collected a lot of the stories of those things that had come before him. So um, anyways, he's a great resource, great resource. I just had a thought about um, bringing this all to why we look at the martyrs and what Mm -hmm. does that mean for our lives today. And you kind of mentioned to this, I hate to sort of chicken little the fate of America and say we're headed down the path of Rome Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm, we're on that. mm -hmm. But the parallels are really Mm -hmm. a little bit frightening. And I think about, there's a great quote from C.S. Lewis that says something like, um, in a time if you pray for a lot of miracles, be prepared for a lot of martyrs. Mm -hmm. And that they go together. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we're kind of moving in that direction. And I, but in this country we're, we're obviously not yet, at least, shedding our blood. But we look at an unbloody martyrdom of living the Christian life, living especially an Orthodox Catholic lifestyle as an unbloody martyrdom, and that fits with the sexual component that you were saying. Like, all these women are virgins, but really they're, it's about self-control. It's about controlling and, and gifting your sexuality. And part of living in this country, in this area especially, is living a utterly countercultural sexual lifestyle. And so we look to these women and, and can see our own sort of, I don't want to overstate it, but do you, do you know what yeah. I'm saying? Like an unbloody martyrdom about living, not contracepting, having four kids, taking them all to the grocery store and having or somebody say, do you know, or 18, yeah, right. yes, exactly. <laughs> having people say things yeah. that are wildly inappropriate. Um, yeah. But it's all there. And so you can look to these women and see the reflection of truth of my life and the reflection of truth in their life absolutely, and bring it together. And can I just add, it's very beautifully said, we should just conclude with that, but I risk adding something that, that and not just on the, on the level of sexuality, but our whole life. And during Lent right now, the church lays before us a time when we're constantly feeding ourselves. I'm hungry, I get food. I'm tired, I sleep. I'm thirsty, I drink. I want to relax, I watch television. And we, we live this life of just... Uh, self-indulgence. Maybe not always in a bad way, but the church in her wisdom says it's now that we take those things that we become so used to just going to and reining them in. Food is good. Meat is good. But the church doesn't take it away from us to say, that's bad. No, there's no bad meat. Okay, well, I guess unless the refrigerator goes bad, but, but, uh, but no to say to you, there's something more important. Set these things aside so that you learn how to gain control over the lower things. And when you gain control over them, you will then gain mastery of the greater things in our life. Fasting, almsgiving, and prayer, as the church sets out for us, is a kind of the, uh, the preschool of martyrdom. Not necessarily a bloody martyrdom of witness. I gain control over myself with the help of Christ so that I become the instrument of Jesus Christ. I become the hand of John the Baptist pointing the way to Christ, of St. Agatha and St. Cecilia and St. Perpetua and St. Felicity. That I point the way to Christ in my life. That I become transformed having died to my former life. Right here in Lent is the time. Don't let it go. Don't let it pass by. Don't do the bare minimum. Turn off the television. Turn off the radio. Get rid of the distractions. For the next 30 days, for this next month, become an athlete of Jesus Christ. Struggle and fight and be beaten down 
and cry. Find yourself on the ground and only then will we find the hand of Jesus Christ to lift us up. God bless you. I'll see you this Wednesday. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist. Pray for us.